this is a very special day. Of course, it's always a great day. This is God's day, and it's a God's day for you, and we celebrate life, and we celebrate the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me add my greeting to all of you who are online. You still uh, could be sheltered in place, or perhaps you're away from us for just a bit, and then everyone right here in the room, it is so good uh, to be together. More about that and how we're regathering at the end of this service. But I want to introduce to you uh, my dearest lifelong friend, and that is Dr. O.S. Hawkins. O.S. and I uh, met as high school students in East Fort Worth at church, the Sagamore Hill Baptist Church. And in that time, in fact, I was thinking as we were singing, Turn Your Eyes on Jesus. Uh, we often sang that at Camp Sagamore, uh, which was our great youth camp every summer. and. Uh, so many memories of growing up together in church, and then uh, God called us to preach. We were ordained the same night in February of 1970, so last I counted, that was 50 years ago this year. And uh, then we met our wives thereabouts uh, the, that same time, Deb and Susie, and we were married the same summer. In fact, O.S. and Susie Hawkins are celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary this week. And so congratulations to O.S. and Susie. And uh, God has blessed them with two uh, wonderful daughters. And uh, we're so grateful for the fact that now uh, they have six grandchildren. I think I could name them all. There's Truett, there's Hayes, there's Audrey, and there is Hallie, and uh, there is Julia, and there is, there he is, Jackson. He's going to be up here in uh, just a moment. Uh, but that's Wendy Hermes and Brian, a daughter, and Holly, who is married to our own David Shivers, who preached last night and did an outstanding job in our Saturday night service. So we've got three generations of this family uh, together, and we're just celebrating. O.S. pastored at the First Baptist Church of Hobart, Oklahoma. I succeeded him there uh, several years later, First Baptist Church of Ada, Oklahoma, and then 16 years at uh, Fort Lauderdale's First Baptist Church. God came down, anointed that ministry in that place and that day in South Florida. Uh, God used him, and then he came to Dallas in 1993 as the pastor of the great and historic First Baptist Church of Dallas, succeeding Dr. W.A. Criswell there, wonderful uh, uh, pastorate at First Baptist Dallas. And then for these past uh, 23 years, he has led Guidestone, uh, which is our Southern Baptist annu uh, annuity board, really, and uh, insurance and savings, and done an incredible job. And all at the same time, while leading this multi-billion dollar organization and helping pastors and their wives and their widows, uh, he's been preaching all over the country, all over the world. He's authored, I don't know, 30, 40 books. And the most recent that you can get in our bookstore for sure right now are the code books, beginning with the Joshua Code. The latest is the Apostles Code, the Believers Code. Uh, I would encourage you, Prestonwood Bookstore is open. I would encourage you to go by and pick up some of the code books, the O.S. Hawkins books. But I love this man, and I'm so grateful. The Bible says there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He is certainly a brother uh, to me in all of these years as we've shared life and love together. So I want you to welcome O.S. Hawkins, but before he preaches, I want uh, grandson Jackson to come up here. Come on up, Jackson. This is Jackson Shivers. Hustle up. And uh, he's also hearing a ministry call, a preaching call on your life. Is that right? All right, put that microphone up there. There you go. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And. Uh, and uh, he's one of our greatest young men in our church. He's a student at Prestonwood Christian Academy, plays on our basketball team. I'm looking up to you now. But I've asked Jackson to lead the prayer before his poppy and Dr. O.S. Hawkins comes to preach. Lead us. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We welcome you into this place today, Lord. Just please move in our hearts as Dr. Hawkins gives us a message. Help us to remember that you're in control no matter what we go through in life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, buddy. Well, thank you. It's a joy to be back uh, in the pulpit here at Prestonwood. And I just want to say what a blessing it is to be a member of this church, to 
see how we are penetrating the darkness with light everywhere you go, whether it's the pregnancy center or the food ministry or everything we're doing to take advantage of these days uh, to lift up the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe these days of COVID and these days of social distancing and these days of isolation are preparing the church for the greatest harvest we've ever seen uh, that is coming. And so I want us to open our Bibles this morning to 1 Kings chapter 17. Uh, Who of us could have ever believed that just a few short months ago, uh, we would be going through what we're going through? We would be watching baseball games on television with cardboard cutout people in the stands and and piped in cheers and nobody in the stands. It's just an incredible time in which we're living. But we are not the first people that uh, ever had to social distance, ever had to shelter in place. In fact, the Bible is laced like a thread woven through the pages of the Bible with person after person, man after woman, that God call to do the same thing we're doing, to social distance. I don't have time to go through all of them, but uh, think of Noah, Noah and his family. Talk about social distancing. There they were, just their family in the ark for all that time. Uh, Moses, uh, on the backside of a desert by himself, Uh, all through the Bible, people were called to social distance. Even our Lord, 40 days in the wilderness, he distanced himself socially from other people. Uh, The apostle Paul, after he was converted in Acts chapter 9, do you remember what happened? He isolated himself. He social distanced for over three years in Arabia, preparing for a ministry that would change the world. John, the great apostle John, he had his social distancing experience the Isle of Patmos, exiled there away from family, friends, everybody he knew in that particular scene. But but my favorite person in the Bible that God instructed to social distance was Elijah. And here in 1 Kings 17, we have the story uh, beginning in verse 1. It says, now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither rain nor dew these years except by my word. And the word of the Lord came to him saying, depart from here, turn eastward and social distance yourself. Hide yourself by the brook Kareth, which is east of the Jordan." And uh, you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and hid himself by the brook Kareth, that is east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. And after a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. You know, this is the first mention of Elijah in all the Bible. One of the mightiest men of God in all the Bible, the man who stood on Mount Carmel and called down fire from heaven to consume that altar, defeated all those prophets of Baal. And this is the first mention of him. And and note what he's called here. He's identified as Elijah the Tishbite from the mountain region of Gilead. He was just known by his name and his locale, where he came from. Uh, That's Jack Graham from Dallas, Texas. That's how they knew him. But after he social distanced here at the Brook Kareth, after he took in there, and a few chapters later, people would see Elijah walking down the street, and they no longer said, there goes Elijah the Tishbite from Gilead. You know what they begin to say? There goes Elijah, the man of God. And then over in 2 Kings, before he's translated into heaven in that chariot, of that, in that chariot whirlwind of fire, people would see him walk down the street, and they would simply say, 
There he goes. There goes the man of God. He was so consumed with the passion to serve the Lord that he had even lost his identity, became known as the man of God. But this first trip, this social distancing experience, can, it can be used for one of two things. It can be used to get frustrated and fearful and, and filled with anxiety and frustration, or we can see it as an opportunity, just like Elijah did, to take in in order to, to give out. You know, James in, in, in the New Testament, chapter 5, verse 17, said, James said, Elijah was of the same nature as you are and I am. He was made up of the same stuff we are, no different from us. And yet what enabled him to, to sail Mount Carmel, to, to go from one miracle after another miracle after another miracle, all through the scriptures? I think we're going to see that this first little experience he had down at this obscure brook, social distancing, was the most important trip he ever took. And there are several lessons that we can learn in our own social distancing experience from Elijah today, these many, many centuries later. And here's the first lesson we can learn in social distancing. And that is this, God has a plan for us. Amen. This is not taking God by surprise. The Bible still says, as it does in Daniel, that the most high still rules over the affairs of men. God has a plan for us in this. We find it in verse 3. The Bible says in verse 3 that he was instructed to depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Kareth, which is east of the Jordan. Now, the first mention of him here, he goes before Ahab in verse 1. Now, Ahab, who was Ahab? You remember the kingdom of Israel had divided into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom? The southern kingdom had a few good kings. The northern kingdom didn't have one good king. And Ahab, the king of the northern kingdom, if you look back in chapter 16, the preceding chapter, verse 33, it says, Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel than all the kings before him. He was the most wicked of all the wicked. And here comes this nobody from Gilead, and he stands up before King Ahab, and he pronounces a drought on the land while his head will be on the chopping block by sundown. And just in the nick of time here in verse 3, we see that God has a plan just when we need it. Arise and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook chair. Now, the key word in verse 3 is that word hide. You ought to just circle it in your Bible. What was God actually telling him to do? Go down there and hide so you won't have your head cut off? Go down there and hide because he, the king and his wicked wife Jezebel is going to be after you? You know, there, there are a couple of words in the Hebrew Old Testament. We translate into our English word hide. One of those words means to hide so you won't be found out. Hide so nobody can find you. That word is used, for example, in Exodus 2. Remember when Moses killed that Egyptian? Remember what he did? He hid him. In the sand. He, he dug a little hole, he put that Egyptian there, and he covered him over, and he hid him so he couldn't be found out. One of those words means to hide so he can't be found out. Same words used in Joshua 2. Remember when Rahab had those two spies of Israel come up there, on her, and she went up, took them up on her roof, and what'd she do with them? Hid them on the roof. She took those, that, that, that flax, and she had them lay down on the roof and put that flax over the top of them so they couldn't be found. Same word in Joshua 7 when up there at Ai, the, the, the Achan took the, the spoils and he dug a hole in his tent and he hid them there in his tent. That word means to hide so you can't be found out. What's God's plan for us? Is that what it is? Is that what we're trying to do, hide from something? There's another word, hide, that's not translated many times in the Old Testament. But, for example, one of the times it is is Genesis chapter 31, verse 49 with Jacob and Laban. Remember when Jacob said that, that God might be between you and me while we are absent from one another. While we're absent from one another. 
That's the word we find here in 1 Kings. This is what God's plan is for us. This is what God is instructing Elijah to do. Not go down there and hide so he won't be found out, but to get apart, to absent himself, to come aside and absent himself. And do you know that social distancing, absenting ourselves from all the other things that are swirling around us is nothing new in the making of a man of God. Joseph had his brook, Kareth. There he was in an Egyptian dungeon, but it prepared him to be the prime minister of of Egypt. Moses had his brook, Cherith, 40 years in the wilderness, but it prepared him to be the great emancipator of his people. All through the Bible, people that God have used, have used, have had a time of a social distancing experience. Joshua lived 40 years in the wilderness with Canaan in his heart. The apostles, remember what they tarried, social distanced themselves. They pulled apart in the upper room and tarried until they were endued with power from on high. And they burst out from there and took the gospel in one generation to the bounds of the Roman Empire itself. Our Lord had his brook chair. 30 years in the carpenter's shop in virtual obscurity, preparing for a ministry that will only last three years. And then at the end of his life, he found his brook care of social distancing himself neath those old trees in Gethsemane's garden, taking in where he might give out. Social distancings are times for us to do that to take in where we can give out. We we can't make a big splash on Carmel like some of us want to do unless we've had that time where we recognize God's plan for us. And we can see these days in which we're living right now as a as an opportune time for those of us who are social distancing to use this time like so many men and women the Bible did. It's God's plan for us. We learned that lesson there, to absent ourselves. But you know, there's another lesson we learn, and that's this. God not only has a plan for us, God has a promise for us. Look in the next verse, verse 4. Uh, and verse 4 says, And you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. Now, if hide is the most important word in verse 3, there is the most important word in verse 4, Elijah received a promise from God, but it was restricted and it was conditional. It was there at that brook Kareth that God had, had promised to meet him. Uh, there. Suppose, now he was from the mountain region of Gilead. And, and, and anybody who's traveled in the lands of the Bible and seen those rugged, rocky, barren wilderness that's out there, suppose Elijah had taken it upon himself to say, you know, I remember a place back there when I was a kid, playing back in those back canyons. I remember a place where nobody could see me. I remember going back up there and hiding. I'll just go there. Suppose he had taken it upon himself to say that. He could have gone there. And you know what would have happened? He would have lived outside the promise and the provision of God. What are we learning here? That it is a very important thing, being in the will of God, being where God wants you to be, and doing what God wants you to do. That's where God has promised to meet us. There, uh, in in the middle of his will, God has promised to meet you there. Could it be that you're somewhere else? I may be speaking to someone today online or here in this building, and God has promised to meet you there in salvation. He's promised that if you would come to him, he would forgive you of your sin. He would come into your life, and you could begin the great adventure for which you were created to know him in the intimacy of father and child and the forgiveness of sin. And God has promised to meet you there, but you're somewhere else. Maybe God has promised to meet you there in repentance of some sin that so easily besets you that you just continue to go back to over and over and over and over. 
And God has promised to meet you there in repentance and turning from that. But you're somewhere else. Maybe God has promised to meet you there in reconciliation with somebody else. A broken relationship. It's displeasing to God. And he's promised to meet you there in reconciliation with that other person. But you're somewhere else. And you wonder why you live apart from the promise and the blessing and the provision of God. Maybe God has promised to meet you there in restitution. Maybe you need to make restitution for some wrong. And God has promised to meet you and and meet you there. I don't know where your there is, but I know this. I know God will lead you there. And if you'll go there, you'll begin to find in social distancing, God has a plan for us and God has a promise for us. He's promised to meet us there in the middle of his will for our lives. Now, there's a third thing we learn in social distancing, if we really think about it, and that is that God has a prerequisite for us. Look at verse 5. Look at, just look at the next verse. So, this doesn't sound like proper English, but it is. So, he went and did. He just went and did. He went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and he lived by the brook Kareth. He social distanced himself there. That's east of the Jordan. He just went and did according to the word of the Lord. No doubt. Lord, you can't mean the brook Kareth. I I, I know some other better places. No doubt. No defiance. Lord, you can't mean you want me to separate from from the office and, and, and work at home and do all these other things. No doubt. No defiance. No delay. Okay, Lord, I will, but I've got a few things. No, no doubt, no defiance, no delay. He just went and did. What is this prerequisite? It's obedience. Some of us wonder why we live outside the provision of God and never learn the lessons of social distancing. It's because of a lack of obedience. A lack of obedience is the core of our problem. You know, why don't we obey? You know what? Listen. I obeyed my parents. You know why? Because I trusted them. I trusted them to know what was best for me, especially when I was a child. And you know why I trusted them? Because I knew them. Uh, Jack mentioned our relationship for over a half of a century. I know him, and he knows me. And I'm not going to say anything else more about that. (laughs) But we know each other. But because I know him, I trust him. And if he called me up and said, OS, oh, uh, I, I, I need you to do something, I want you to do this. I wouldn't doubt it. I wouldn't defy it. I wouldn't delay it. I, w- I would do it. Well, you know why I would obey him? Not, not because he's my pastor now, but because I trust him. And you know why I trust him? Because I know him. Do you know why some of you don't obey God? You want to, but you don't. It's simple. I'll tell you why you don't. You don't really trust him. If you really trusted the Lord, you'd obey him. But some of you live in it with a lack of obedience and do not obey God because the truth is, it's not because you don't obey, it's because you don't trust him. And you know why you don't trust him? It's because you don't know him. I'm talking about in the intimacy of father and child feeding on his word, listening to him every day, speaking to him, communing with him. If you really knew him, if you really knew him, you'd trust him. And if you really trusted him, you'd obey him. That's why Jesus said in John 14, 21, if you love me, don't sing about it. Don't don't say, oh, I love you, Lord. Don't tell somebody else how much you love Jesus. He said, if you love me, Here's how I'll know. You will keep my commandments. You'll obey me because you trust me. And you trust me because you know me. Use these days of social distancing to get to know him 
in the intimacy of father and child. And when you do, you'll start trusting him. And when you start trusting him, obeying him will be as natural as water running downhill. There's a fourth thing we see here at the Brook Cherith, and that's this. God has a plan for us. God has a promise for us. God has a prerequisite for us. God has a provision for us. Look at the next verse, verse 6. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Now, after social distancing, hiding himself at the brook Cherith, after being in the middle of the Lord's will, being there, after obeying God, obeying, after all those things, God provided. And there he is in the bottom of that canyon with that little brook Carath, and up through those great canyon cliffs, all of a sudden he sees these little dark spots way at the top, and here they come. And, and, and he begins to make them out. They're birds, they're ravens, and they're soaring down. And they bring him bread and meat in the morning. And they come back that night, and they bring him bread and meat in the evening. And he drinks from the brook. The most beautiful thing in this whole story to me. You know, the, in Proverbs 30 it says, Every word of God is pure. Every word of God is pure. There is a reason God said these were going to be ravens. This is the most beautiful thing in the whole story to me. Because for a kosher Jew like Elijah, Deuteronomy 11, uh, De uh, Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14, both say that a raven is a filthy, dirty bird, and not, they're not even to touch a raven. It's unkosher, it's filthy, it's dirty, and yet God used this raven to send bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. You know, we, we hear about birds and we, we do uh, associations with them. If I mention the word stark, you'd mention baby or birth. If I mention dove, think of what you think of, peace. If I mention pelican, you think of fish. If I mention robin, you think of spring. If I mention pigeon, you think of a messenger bird. I hope that's what you think of, of a messenger bird. But a raven. You know, Susie and I were driving back from the hill country the other day and on, on one of those two-lane roads out in the middle of nowhere, and all of a sudden, way up ahead, I saw a bunch of black birds just circling around, buzzards. A buzzard is the cousin to the raven. And you know what they were doing? I, I, I Sure enough, as soon as we got up there, there was a, a deer that had been run over on the side of the road, and they were down there feeding on that dead carcass. They eat roadkill. Dead. They're filthy, dirty birds. And yet God sent a raven. We wouldn't have done that. I would have probably sent an eagle soaring down through there or a dove or some beautiful bird. God sent a raven. You know what he's trying to tell us? That if God can use a raven in social distancing, he can use you. If God can, can uh, provide for a raven. Listen, one, there's a little obscure verse in Psalm 147. I think it's about verse 6. It says, God provides for the cattle with the grass of the field and for the ravens when the cattle fall and die. If God can provide for a raven, he can provide for you. If God can use a raven, he can use you. Some wonder why we live outside the blessing and provision of God. Could it be that, that God has told us to go and hide somewhere and absent ourselves and, and, and go there and we're somewhere else? But to be true to the text, there's one final lesson to be learned in social distancing, and I'm through. And that is this. God has a purpose for us. In the, all of this social distancing, God doesn't just have a plan for us. He doesn't just have a promise for us. He doesn't just have a prerequisite for us. He doesn't just have a provision for us. He has a purpose for us. Amen. And look at verse 7. And after a while, 
the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. You're prone to say, hmm, some God that is. Promised Elijah he could go down there to the brook and, and he'd f- send him bread and meat in the morning, bread and meat in the and he could drink from the brook. And he got down there in the will of God, doing what God told him to do, being where God told him to be. And he got down there and the brook dried up. Some God that is. What was happening? I believe Elijah's heart was being tested. You see, God was going to use him like he used few people in human history. And I believe God was testing his heart to see whether his trust was in that brook Kareth or in the living God. Because you know what happens to you and me in life? God blesses us. We get in his will and we, we're in his way and, and all of a sudden he, blessings pour out to us. And you know what happens if we're not careful? So very subtly. Maybe he blesses you financially. And all of a sudden, your focus turns to trust in the blessing instead of in the blessor. It happens so easily. Could it be that God was just testing his heart? Like he's testing some of ours to see if his trust was in the blessing in that brook careth or if it was still where it needs to be in the living God. In the living God. You know, there are a lot of folks that are called to sit by drying brooks. Some of you are doing it right now. A lot of you folks listening online right now. Some are called. There are a lot of people sitting by a drying brook. I'm speaking today to some people that are sitting by a drying brook of health. Your health. It's like a drying brook. It's, it's slipping away. There are others that are sitting by drying brooks of Wealth. You don't know what you're going to do next week. The paycheck's not coming anymore, and you're sitting by a drying brook of, of wealth. There's so many sitting by a drying brook. Some of you may be sitting by a drying brook of relationships. That relationship with your husband or your wife or your son or your daughter, your mom or your dad, your, your friend, it's drying up right before your eyes. It's easier to face the prophets of Baal on some Mount Carmel than it is to sit by a drying brook. Why does God allow that? To drain us of ourselves, to drive us to him, to teach us to trust in him and not in the brook. And what will he do when we learn the lessons of social distancing? Well, the next verse, verse 8 says, The word of the Lord came to him just in the nick of time. Arise and go up to Zarephath. There's a widow there who will provide for you there. There's that word again, there. And the next verse, verse 9 says, He just went and did according to the word of God. So use these days of social distancing to trust in him, to see that he's not abdicated his throne. The Most High still rules over all the affairs of men. So, interested in becoming a man or woman of God like Elijah, then arise and turn eastward and hide yourself at the brook careth. Go there. I don't know where your there is. But I know God will lead you. And if while there. The brook dries up. Just remember that's God's way of teaching you to trust in him. And not in the brook. And he'll lead you on. To higher ground. Days of social distancing in the church are going to be their greatest days of preparation for what God has ahead. Just as they were for Elijah, who went from that experience to the greatest days of his life. Go there. I don't know where your there is, but I know God will lead you. 
Let's bow our hearts together as we pray. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. It may be that for some of you there is to come to meet him in the free parting of sin, to come to know Christ as a personal Savior. Maybe you're there as repentance, that God is speaking to you about something in your life. Maybe it's reconciliation. Maybe there's somebody that you need to get right with. I don't know where you're there is, but I know God will lead you. Father, seal these words in our hearts. We pray today in Christ's name. Amen. And looking right here, God has brought you to this place, this time in your life to bring you to Jesus. And over these past four months, as we have been sheltering in place, and it's been a time of crisis and fear in so many lives, we have seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people pray and receive Christ, inviting Christ into their lives and receiving the forgiveness of sins and a new life in Christ and the promise and the hope of heaven. And right now, where you are in this room, or in your home or your family, the Holy Spirit is drawing you to Jesus. This is the time, this is the place. There'll never be a better time and never, never be a better place for you to give your life to follow Jesus than right now, this very moment. He died on the cross for your sins. He rose again on the third day. And the Bible says God so loved the world he loves you, that he gave his only son, Jesus, that whoever believes in him would not perish, that is, die and face judgment and hell, would not perish, but have eternal life. Receive the gift of eternal life. You don't earn it, you don't deserve it, but you need it desperately now. Open the gift. For by grace, the gift of God, are you saved, not of works. We don't boast in this, but we trust in Christ. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. So right where you are, right now, in this place, in this moment, this is not an accident that you've been in this service. This is God's plan for your life. So pray and say, Lord Jesus, I do trust you. I turn from my sin, the way that I've been living without you, and I trust in you and you only as my Lord, my Savior. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. Forgive me. Just ask him. Forgive me of all my sins. Live in me. And may I live for you in the power of your Spirit until you come for me. Make it your prayer. This is your time. This is your there. This is your moment. This is your miracle. Others, it is a moment of repentance and restoration and revival. God has you isolated, but he has penetrated the place where you are, and his presence is real right now. Repent of your sins. Get right with God. Restore your relationship with God and with others. Whatever God is doing in your life now, make it your moment. Again, not chance, not circumstance that brought you to this moment there where you are. Rededicate your heart and your life to Christ and say, Lord, from this day forward, by your grace and by your power, I'm going to walk with you. I'm coming back to you. We got a lot of prodigals right now in the world. Prodigals who are not living for Christ. You've been one of them. But God's found you in the far country somewhere and is bringing you back to him. Lord, how we thank you for these moments, these miracles taking place for the message and the promise that you make every place your place when we call upon your name. And so, Lord, for those who are trusting you now, those who are renewing faith, those that you're adding to your kingdom, we praise you. Give them courage. Give them strength. 
now to act and to do in obedience what you have told us all to do, and that is to live for you in the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you for joining us for worship at Prestonwood. As you heard earlier, if you made a decision for Christ, please text Jesus to 74788. We would love to connect with you and give you these great resources to help you grow in your faith. One is a New Believer's Bible with helpful notes to help you study God's Word. The other is a book by Pastor Jack Graham on the next steps to take as you pursue this new life in Christ. As we close, I'd like to thank you for your faithful giving to support Prestonwood and the work God is doing through our ministries. If you would like to give, text the word GIVE to 74788 or visit prestonwood.org give. It's been a joy worshiping with you and we look forward to seeing you again soon.